Good afternoon, everyone. It looks like everyone who is trying to join currently is here with us. Uh, we'll get started in just a second here. Uh, you're welcome to keep your video off if you like. We will be doing some small group work later, so we'd love for you to turn your video on later if you can. Uh, please keep yourself muted during the presentation and just to let you know we are recording this session today uh, and that will be made available to you to watch again later. I'm Audrey, I'm with New Hampshire Environmental Educators and I'll turn things over to Mark uh, to do some more introductions and get us started. Awesome. Hello everybody, my name is Mark Nutter. I'm the Grants Manager at New Hampshire Audubon. Really excited that you all are here. Um, this afternoon, spending time with us um, in the first of an awesome webinar series called Screen to Green, um, held, you know, once a month through the um, end of April, um, which is a series brought to you by Project Learning Tree New Hampshire, New Hampshire Fish and Game, New Hampshire Environmental Educators, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, New England Field Office, and um, us at New Hampshire Audubon. And um, just as a precursor. Um, if you haven't signed up for the rest of the, um, the presentations, please feel free to do so. The next one after today is going to be on March the 4th, um, talking about a virtual program sampler. And then we have one on Wednesday, March 24th, Designing an Outdoor Classroom by um, Marilyn Zyga. And then our final um, session will be uh, Monday, April 12th, and the topic there will be safe and ha safe, happy, healthy outdoor learning. So we hope to see you there as well. And so today we're going to talk about um, winter blooms, the virtual garden tour, um, including activities to discover and explore pollinator roles and habitat. And I'll let um, our other presenters introduce themselves as we um, as we go through the presentation. And a little outline of what to expect for the next hour. Um, Ted's gonna give us some project context and how um, we got to this point. I'll do a little a virtual tour, tour walkthrough um, describing what features you can find in the virtual tour. And then Will will um, guide us through an activity that includes both um, individual reflection and, um, and group share out. And then we'll come back together as a group and um, talk about feedback. So we're really interested um, in not only sharing this resource with you, but also learning from you um, in ways we can improve it to, to meet your needs um, in your classroom. So at this point, I will throw it over to Ted. All right, well, hello everybody. I'm Ted Kenziar with US Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, I'm gonna go as quickly as possible here to give you a little bit of history on how we got to where we are um, and save uh, the bulk of all this time for, for the fun stuff, the interactive stuff. So um, not going to bore you with the details of how uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service started with uh, schoolyard habitats, um, but um, back in about 2011, our schoolyard habitat project guide came out and really started pushing the service into getting um, schoolyard habitats throughout the country. A um, few years later after that, it started out in California. So a few years later after that, it kind of worked its way out to the, towards the East Coast. And in 2015, um, I was approached and they said we had some funding. And if we knew any, um, any uh, partners that would be willing to, to work with you and to get kids outside. So I said, yeah, okay, we can work with uh, Audubon. So 2015 got together with New Hampshire Audubon Society and we started brainstorming about what can we do? What can we use this money for? And so we decided to use some of the funding to build schoolyard gardens and some of the funding to go out and educate and also bring some students over to Audubon. So Again, um, I can go into a whole webinar on, on how this all happened and the things I learned about funding and getting kids outside. So um, throughout that time, I was always researching, looking to see what other groups started working on this. And it kind of led to what we do. And if uh, Mark, you can move on to that next slide for me, that'd be great. 
started pulling together um, not only some of these groups that were mentioned here, but you know, other ones we were looking at too online and trying to figure out, okay, what, what does everyone do? Well, we all, we all kind of have the same intent. Um, we want to help nature. We want to get kids outside. We want to educate them. We want to protect the environment. Um, some of us focused a little more heavily on, on some or the other portions. Um, so 2015 is kind of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, New Hampshire Audubon uh, working. And then we started pulling in other, other groups, Project Learning Tree, New Hampshire Fish and Game, private consultants, um, schools, organizations. And we kind of, we were all working differently, but for the same reasons. We had educational classes that we put on. We were trying to save species. We were trying to build habitat. We were trying to build gardens. We were trying to give children uh, lessons uh, via paper or actually going out in the field and teaching them, working in planned landscapings and native habitat. And so over those years, you can see we've worked on quite a few projects together. So Mark, if you can move forward on that slide. So since 2015, handing out money every about January, um, as the process, as the years go on, we, we've developed a little, hopefully simpler application. Please let us know if you want us to fix that, if you have applied for the action grant in the past or currently this year. Um, but you can see we've done quite a bit of projects out there um, all over the state of New Hampshire. And you know, at first we were thinking this is going to be just habitat work. And then it, it, it evolved um, to outdoor learning spaces, to trails, interpretive signs, uh, working not just in schools, but maybe with the local libraries and things to that nature. Uh, and it has really come a long way since then. Um, and, you know, ironically, uh, Mark, if you want to move forward with that slide, one of the things that ended up happening is we kind of took a look at the New Hampshire Audubon and uh, we said, you know, it's right down the street here in Concord. And it looked like a lot of the schools that I was going to. It had landscaping, but it wasn't planned or thought out. It was just kind of there around the building, a lot of issues with snow drifts and plows piling things up. And so we decided to invest some money with Audubon and help of tons of volunteers. Uh, and uh, we, we redid the landscaping with the intent of having schoolyard um, schools, organizations, groups, uh, New Hampshire Audubon hosts many summer programs and programs throughout the year. And they, they do events and weddings and you name it to beautify it, but to also to educate people to show them how easy it was. And so out of that, Mark, you can move to the next slide. We came up with this, this map and we said, wow, well, not only is this useful for, um, you know, our planting plan and our design that we paid for, but wow, we could utilize this and kind of give this to a school and have them utilize this very easily. And so we decided to take what was at Audubon and we were able to use it um, and say, you know, a lot of schoolyards have this. They want butterfly gardens or a mixed pollinator sunny garden, maybe a hummingbird or shade garden, um, you know, uh, covered up by this map and another page, we have kind of a sensory garden with herbs and, and things like that, um, general landscaping. And uh, so, Ironically or not, uh, New Hampshire Audubon came up, uh, Mark came up, they came up with a great idea of doing a virtual tour of this garden to get more people involved. And um, I was super excited about it. Um, I was like, yeah, what a great idea. And we started moving forward with it and luck, I don't know, uh, coincidence what, um, COVID started. And here we are on Zoom meetings and team meetings and virtual calls all the time. And this couldn't be any more perfect. Um, so what we're trying to get out of this is we wanna introduce this to you. This is a, a template, it's not active or live yet. We wanna get your opinion and help us build this further and, and move forward with it. And 
it, the sky's well, sky's kind of the limit, uh, but it's uh, anything you think that can help you and teach the kids, throw the ideas out, make it whatever we can do, scavenger hunts to, to we're going to have um, um, a little worksheet for you to do later. But any idea that you have, please let us know. Put it in the chats. Uh, put it, um, you know, call us, email us. Uh, you can talk to us today, anything like that. So with that, I am going to move it on to uh, Mark to kind of give you an idea of how the virtual garden goes. And um, we'll head from there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, and yeah, of course, we are in an ideal world. We're getting people out there um, and involved. Um, but sometimes you can't make the trip. Um, so that's what we want this virtual tour to be is potentially a primer for a visit. Um, or uh, like we are now, we can't see these types of plants underneath all this snow. Um, so I'm gonna, if you all um, will bear with me, I'm gonna do a little Bob Ross um, with y'all and um, show you some of the features um, and how to navigate through the virtual tour. And we'll put this link in the chat in a little bit. Um, but the first thing um, you see when you first get in is this. Um, and you might even see this welcome a screen, which kind of gives you some context to what you're about to experience in this virtual tour. And so some uh, navigational tips. Um, if you just double click anywhere, it goes full screen, um, which I really prefer because um, it's really immersing your, yourself uh, or your students into this experience. Um, you can, it's pretty uh, intuitive to navigate around. You see my cursor, how it's a hand. You can grab it and move it around to see. Um, these the images were taken with a special 360 degree um, camera. So you can pan around the whole um, scene, each and every scene. Um, so you can do that with the mouse um, or these buttons at the very top. Um, you can also zoom in um, using these buttons or simply the, um, the scroll on your, your mouse if you're interested in looking a little closer. And when the cursor changes to uh, a finger, um, the name of that plant will pop up. And thanks to um, our staff at uh, Diane DeLuca and um, the technology specialist, Adam, um, Blankenbricker, um, we've been able to identify and name a lot of these plants. Not all of them, um, but a majority of them are um, named in this virtual tour. So that's how you can see um, the different names of these plants. And then the next thing you'll notice is um, this magnifying glass. And this indicates a content box. So to look more, to find out more, you can click on any one of those magnifying glasses um, that pop up with uh, multimedia and um, some more uh, content um, as far as the description of what's going on there. To move in between um, scenes, um, just as this arrow might suggest to you in, in an intuitive manner, um, you just click that, that's where we were over there, um, to get to the next scene. And it's just the same. Uh, we've got plant names that pop up and then content boxes. And you can navigate through the entire tour just by using these arrows on the ground. Um, but there's another way that I want to point out to you, um, which is this map at the very top. And in this way, you can just jump over to the back of the garden and say, I want to go here and see what's, um, what's happening back here. And here we got some really nice morning sunlight hitting this patch of, oh, black eyed Susans. How about that? Um, and then the last thing I want to point out, I think, is um, embedded in some of these um, images are these additional images. So if you click on this 360 degree, um, you can see um, the pollinator garden from a, a different perspective, from perhaps the perspective of a pollinator uh, bee bopping around looking for nectar or, or food, um, something that Willa might mention. Um, and the last thing is, um, 
uh, what is the last thing? I think the last thing is just that. Um, be on the lookout in some of these hidden 360-degree um, views. Um, there could be additional content. Um, and I hope that the map um, somehow, somewhat informs what you want to look at. So up in the butterfly garden, um, you'll find um, things that are attractive to butterflies, like bee balm or uh, milkweed. So um, when we share this, the, the link out, um, feel free to, to get around and find those content boxes that are, are really interesting um, to you. Um, and then the last, this is actually the last thing. Um, so say you find something really cool up at the butterfly garden you, and you want to share this out with a group in this virtual space. You can either say, hey, go to the map and go to the butterfly gardens, or each one of these are, are numbered. Um, and it's kind of hard to see in these boxes, but they do have numbers starting with one and going around. Um, but you can also find where you are by opening the scenes tab. And here are all the photos and where you are is highlighted in orange. So if I'm like, hey, Willa, I found the, where the monarch butterflies like to go, go to, go to scene number four. Um, and then you can kind of explore that um, in tandem um, with that other person. Um, and I know I keep saying the last thing, but I keep looking around and I forgot to mention all these other uh, boxes at the very bottom. Um, and those just pop up um, to give you extra content. And um, these yellow um, links will um, connect you to um, further resources. I think I can um, hand it over to Willa at this time, um, because we'll have some time when we're doing that exploration to ask questions about um, the functionality of the virtual tour um, when we get to that. Awesome. Nice job, Mark. That was very impressive. And I learned something new too. Every single time we open up this virtual tour, I'm like, my gosh, I didn't know we could do that. So I'm hoping some of you guys are more technologically adept because I am not. However, if I can do this, all of you and your three-year-olds probably could do this too maybe even better than the rest of us. So how is this relevant for us? How can we utilize these winter blooms? How can we make this virtual 3D tour of a live garden exciting and interactive when it's experienced 2D? Well, the first and foremost thing that I think is the coolest element of this is no matter where you are with your curriculum, you don't have to miss out on the season. You guys can be teaching this and exploring this in the dead of the winter like we are doing at this exact moment in time. It's like four degrees outside and here we are looking at these beautiful blossoms that are bringing me an, a, a subordinate amount of joy, just checking out the colors and the lights and the sun. So first and foremost, this is a healthy experience. Even though we're not directly interacting with the garden, we're not in the soil, we're not smelling the flowers. It brings our brains back to times of easier living in the spring and summer, which will be here before we know it. So the way that we have seen this working out for you guys as educators, whether it's for, speaking of bugs, I have a massive stink bug, sorry, that was very distracting, my apologies. Um, so the way that you guys can use this, whether you are educating with children, educating with adults, using this in actual public schools or school settings or homeschool settings or at nursing homes, anyone can benefit from this and turn it into a learning experience with some very simple creative elements. First and foremost, you guys are going to be seeing pollinator plants, but you're gonna be thinking about pollinators. And so looking at this slide right here, we've got a variety of pollinators that we can find in our eco region of New Hampshire. And we can look at them with simple observation by checking out their mouth parts. We're looking at beaks from our beautiful ruby-throated hummingbird. We're seeing different antennae on some of our insects. We're seeing patterns and colors and shapes and sizes. So having that beautiful Google document with you guys at any given instance with technology, we can introduce our students to some of the pollinators. And you guys can go so far as actually saying, this is a sphinx moth. This is a, a lace-winged sphinx moth who likes to eat this, this, and this, who's adapted for this, this, and this. Or you can tell your older students, we want you to find a native pollinator in New Hampshire. 
and let them go and do the research. So already we're able to cater any activities that we do within this virtual garden tour to a variety of aged learners. We can talk them through the honeybees and the bumblebees for our little kids and have them do a little interactive dance to get them away from the screen for a few seconds while you set it up for something else. But you can also give them a blank paper and say, draw a pollinator. Draw an animal that is designed to feed on nectar and how would they benefit a plant? And then we start learning about stuff like what we'll see in our next slide, which is pollinator syndromes. And that's how we are able to connect the garden with the pollinator. So I'm gonna give you guys just a second to kind of take a peek at this so I don't have to talk over it, but we're looking at on the left-hand side, the traits of the plant that you might be able to see and discover in our virtual garden tour. And then across the columns, you're gonna see the different pollinator species that would be attracted to those specific traits. So for instance, this first column is not relevant to the state of New Hampshire. We don't have bats that are going for nectar because most of our bats eat insects. That's their main diet. But instead of bats, we could swap that for wasps because we have a lot of native wasp species that do very similar things, though usually during the diurnal areas of the day rather than nocturnal like our bat species. But looking at this, you guys can check out the photographs down at the bottom. So you have a quick identification guide for the type of pollinator that may or may not be attracted to those specific traits of the plant species. And if we start really thinking like a pollinator, which for educators and students alike is a really awesome role reversal. And so when you're in the garden, especially with those 360 views, that's the chance to encourage students or yourself, as you're going to be doing shortly, to think like a pollinator, to really be down and close with the flowers. At some point in time, taking the same exact lesson and doing it in the actual gardens where you can experience things like odor and see the nectar for yourself. But for this virtual element, you can still check out color. You can look for nectar guides and we have a slide in just a second that will show you. You can also be looking for the flower shape and the flower sizes and thinking like a pollinator of, would this work for me? Would I, as a honeybee, be attracted to a flower that I'm looking at on the screen. And you should be able to find most of the labels of the flowers too. At some point, I imagine all of the flowers in the virtual tour will have guides. It's a slow and steady process for doing that. But right now there's already tons of them. So one of the activities we'll be doing today is you guys are gonna get out there and think like a pollinator. Let's learn a little bit more about the nectar guides because that one's always a little bit confusing. Mark, we've got a slide, no, you're so good. So nectar guides are truthfully well, I can't say truthfully because I'm not an actual pollinator, yet we might be dealing with that down the line in the future as human pollinators, but right now we are counting on our insect friends to be assisting in that department, which is great. Now these nectar guides are kind of like neon flashing lights that are pointing directly at where the good stuff is. The good stuff for the pollinator being the nectar, the important stuff being the pollen for the plant. And so what happens here when we see these nectar guides on the left and the right flanking the center photos, we've got these direct lines, right? Your, your eyes, just like a pollinator's, are drawn to where those lines and stripes and patterns are leading them directly to where the plant is hoping the insect or the, the species of insect or bird or ma, whomever that's going in there, they're designed for that species in particular. It's one of those questions, guys, like the chicken or the egg, did the flower or the insect come first? So you can decide that for yourselves. But the concept behind a nectar guide is that it's a visible construct on a plant's physical appearance that attracts an insect to where the plant needs them to go in order to get that pollen and move it from species to species or within the same species for reproductive purposes. Now the pictures on the center are ultraviolet photographs of plants that we have commonly seen in our own gardens. And on the left side of those double and triple photos in the middle are what we see with our eyes. And on the other side where you see that those vibrant patterns, especially in that Rudbeckia species up at the top, is what a bee would be seeing and other species with ultraviolet imagery. And it makes it really obvious looking right there. If you guys are looking at that the, the brown headed by the brown eyed Susan or the black eyed Susan, it's a it's a lovely plant. We all love them, but it's nothing vivacious. Look to the right and it's wham. It looks like the plant is is going through a completely different transformation and that is all designed to attract those that are relevant to that plant's existence. The plant doesn't need us, 
And that's why we don't see it as anything but a black-eyed Susan or a brown-eyed Susan. But when a bee sees that, which is what the plant is hoping for, the bee is gonna show up, do what it needs to do, the butterfly is gonna show up, and then off they go with that pollen dispersal. So we are going to be doing a little activity in just a moment that will allow you to really take these educational components, talking about nectar guides, talking about pollinator syndromes, talking about the variety of pollinators that make New Hampshire their home in a way that is effective for all ages and stages of development. And so you guys are going to be our guinea pigs today while we lead you on a little tour, a little exploratory tour of those virtual gardens with the pollinators in mind. So I think we can present that as is. The last slide I've got here is another sample activity. So if you guys wanna have for the students, especially our older students who are a little bit more autonomous, a little older, maybe in the middle school range, we have some sample activities that we came up with that could be easily utilized for them. They are given a specific type of pollinator. And even within that, you know, how many beetles and butterflies and moth species do we have in this region? Tons. So if this wanted to be an expanded just an expanded lesson plan, you could actually say to your students, you know, I want you to pick a specific type of beetle, do some research on it, use these guiding questions for them, and then go off as that creature and find a plant that with its pollinator syndromes would attract you a specific type of beetle to that particular plant. And so the concept for this little activity here, which would take us way too much time, we were thinking of doing this with you guys. We're throwing you a bone. We figured this concept would allow some guiding questions so that the kids can have an opportunity to think like little scientists with some independence, but also have a little bit of guidance. We know that they've got the technology thing down, but the actual how to think like a pollinator, how to question research designs, like looking through the virtual garden tour, as a, as a learner, they need, you know, some of these kids might need a teeny bit more of a structured element. Looking at this one, you can have the opportunity to create photographs, whether they are able to find them from online, take a screenshot, crop it, toss it in. That's for our big kids. For our little kids, a box of crayons can do the same thing. Talk about it, describe it, have them create their own pollinator, knowing about those pollinator syndromes and having seen the garden and knowing what types of flowers are available. They can be totally creative and make their own hybrid species that doesn't yet exist. So there's many different ways of applying all different types of lesson learning from this virtual tour, whether it is here in the middle of the winter or predecessing another actual field trip visit to the McLean Center or using it in any available garden space within your school or in your students' backyards. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything here. So I think it might be time for you guys to do some exploration yourselves. So the plan is this, we are all gonna hang out together for a minute of time and encourage you guys to click on that link that will be showing up in the conversation box momentarily. We want you guys to have full access, full reign to our virtual garden at the McLean Center. And we're gonna give you guys about three minutes to just peruse it on your own. Go and explore, click on some of those boxes, check out how to use all the little arrows, really dive in there for three minutes, go nuts. And then what we're going to be doing is having you guys while you're doing this, look for pollinator syndromes. And we'll also be linking that really sweet guide from pollinators.org into the chat box as well. So you guys can look at those and not have to memorize them. The idea is that while you are perusing the garden, you are thinking like a pollinator. And the idea being what type of plants would appeal to certain types of pollinators and why? When we break into our groups, we're gonna have you guys kind of divvied out into smaller groups. You're going to talk with your, your new peers about what plant you found and what pollinator you think would make a great match for that plant based on those syndromes that you're going to have access to that chart for as we, as we continue through. I'm hoping that makes sense. This is that time in the classroom where we'd say, does everyone understand? But we can't do that right now. So we're going to hope you understand, but also let you know that you are more than, more than invited to ask questions because this is a learning experience for us as well as it is for you. We are new to navigating this, but we have a lot of high hopes and we know that with everyone's creativity that's here today, we're gonna to be able to, we'll be able to make this even better than it already is. Awesome, thank you so much, Willa. That's a, a wonderful explanation of what to expect. Um, so those of you that are in the meeting, please do click on to that virtual tour and click around and, um, and find that uh, a flower that you might 
find really interesting and then try to describe um, what you're looking at with that, those pollinator syndromes. And we'll give you about another two minutes to do that on your own. And um, feel free to unmute yourself in those, these next two minutes and ask questions. Um, if you want me to um, drive the um, virtual tour um, and, or show you something else, um, that's uh, what we'll be doing for the next two minutes. If you guys have any questions while you're out independently perusing that garden and thinking like a pollinator, feel free to shout them out here or toss them into the chat and one of us will get back to you immediately. Awesome, about one more minute for um, individual exploration before we get tossed into um, breakout rooms to share out. Mark? Yeah, go ahead, Keith. Yeah, this is Keith. Uh, I got to go into another meeting. I'm a fifth grade teacher in uh, Exeter. It's been wonderful. I, uh, is this going to be you're recording it? How will I be able to watch the rest? Because I got to go right now. I believe we'll send it out to the respondents and then okay. also on social media. Perfect. So thank yeah. you very much so far. I wish I could stay for the rest, but I will hopefully watch it and then join the rest of your uh, your workshops. This has been great so far. I can't wait. That sounds awesome. Thanks for joining us, Keith. All Thanks right. Thank you. Here, Keith. Bye, thank Keith. you. Cool. And I think that puts us to our three minutes. So if we want to break into um, our other rooms for the next 15 or so minutes um, to share out what you all found and um, any feedback that you might have for, um, for the tour and us. Okay, she got an invitation to join one of the two groups. Oh, yeah, I just got it in. Okay. Hello, how's it going? Hey, Mark. <clears throat> what did y'all find? Because um, I think I was yapping and I, did, I wasn't really exploring myself. Uh, but, but first, let's do quick introductions. I'm Mark. Hi, I'm Abby Nathan. I'm in Kingston. I'm on the Conservation Commission here, and I do a lot with students. Cool. Nice. Hi, I'm, I'm Dawn Martilla. I'm actually in Massachusetts um, and found your program, and I work with um, an outdoor nature school, and we have an outdoor education garden. Nice. Good deal. Yeah. And I'm Marilyn Wiska. I, I was a wildlife educator from New Hampshire Fish and Game for 20 years and worked with their schoolyard habitat program. So I assist schools in creating outdoor classrooms. Awesome. So what, what flower did you guys um, land on? Well, I was a painted lady butterfly and I landed on a purple coneflower because the coneflower is a nice flat landing space. Awesome. <laughs> I actually probably didn't get enough time to look around. My, I don't know whether it was my computer that was slow. Um, it was just slow to navigate for me. So it could just be my, my end. Um, and and it's probably this tour hasn't seen so much traffic. I was wondering that. Yep. <laughs> it's a it's a fantastic uh, program, though. I love that it's um, that it's there all the time. That it's not necessarily live either, so you're not having to worry about you know people walking by or strange things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I actually, I, I clicked on a mountain laurel just because I happened to like mountain laurels. And as I was scooting around the side of the building, I saw that. <clears throat> and in the description that went along with it, it said that they're pollinated by native bees, mm -hmm. um, primarily. So it's got, you know, it's got kind of an open cup shape. It's pale pink. When I went on to the syndrome chart, pale pink would have gotten me to moth and cup shape would have gotten me to bats. So in this particular instance, it wasn't sinking. 
Mm. Yeah, I think you found the limitation of um, a summary like that. And maybe, maybe that would be an interesting thing to um, bring up in the lesson. You know, this is just the beginning and some pollinators are what more generalist than, you know, what this table suggests. I don't think we had time to really read through and look through. Um, we, we, this was really in a hurry. Um, so I, you know, it, I was just figuring out how to navigate it when I was thinking, okay, what am I going to be? <laughs> <laughs> However, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Uh, I also, uh, I'm involved in Kingston and Pollinator Pathways, New Hampshire, and we're, our mission is um, restoring habitat one yard at a time. We're very much native plant oriented. Um, we were, we had a, um, a pollinator garden planned with the high school last year, but then COVID hit right at the time that we would have been digging up the dirt. Um, so we didn't do that, but I, I am just really amazed not so much of the tech part of this, although that is amazing, but I'm amazed at the, the, um, the angle that you're taking, that you're taking a different look at this by saying, um, by talking about the nectar guides and the syndrome chart. I've never heard that before. And I think it's, it's just a fabulous and interesting way to look at uh, why pollinators choose certain plants and vice versa, why the how the plants evolve to attract the pollinators. And it's, it's just, I, I, I'm just shocked. I'm really amazed and, and wowed by the way that, by the, the, the way that you're looking at this. And um, we're really going to have to adopt this and use this in pollinator pathways too. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, I think yeah, the one, the, how Willa was describing that one activity of like assigning like, hey, you're this pollinator kind of took a lot more of the research. And we were like, okay, well, how do we do this a little faster? Um, that if you can just find a flower that's interesting to you and then kind of hypothesize what insect visits that flower, then it might even lead into like some sit spot times where you're like, okay, well, now we can go there and let's spend some time and kind of test that hypothesis. And maybe we'll find out what Marilyn found out that, you know, that cup shaped flower on a mountain laurel, there's not a bat on it, but a bee is there. And then that's a, like a way to discuss with the student, um, you know, the, the limitations of a summary like that and, and uh, the, the value of that, that field research part. I wonder if it's possible as you're, you know, continuing to craft this tour. I don't know if it gets used by the regular, the general public as much as you expect it's gonna be used. But if there were a way in the descriptions, like in the mountain laurel, when that popped up, if it had all the description of the flower, you know, it's got this kind of fragrance and this kind of shape and this kind of color, which would give a student time to then figure out what might pollinate it mm. and then there could be something you click on that gets into that depth of yeah it's native bees and here's what kind of native bees to expect it's not all of them it's these particular types of native bees so like la layers mm -hmm. of information. Mm. yeah I, I love that idea especially connecting the viewer or the student to maybe what it might smell like because you obviously can't get that through um, the screen, and then right. diving into those different layers. Thank you for that. Would it be worthwhile? I mean, since we're we're on here, and I think we can still, or maybe we can't. Yeah, I can still access the chat. Would it make sense to spend a, a couple more minutes looking through the tour? Oh since yeah, absolutely. On it, Evelyn. And I know for myself, I just like just started, um, and we can still hear each other. Yeah. Right? about what we're seeing. Absolutely. Yeah, let's spend the rest of that, our time doing that. I think we probably have another seven or so minutes. Um, so if you just want to tab over to your um, your web browser and um, keep looking at that. Um, we're That's really a, interested. That is a possibility because I know that Dawn was having challenges getting in there and I, I don't want to just make a frustration. Uh, frustration. Yeah. 
guys. I think that's a great idea. I'm in there now having a look and I think, um, yeah, let's all click on the same number or something and look at something together. Pull this up again. I think I'm on number six. I think I am at the coneflower. There's a little bench. Um, I find that I really want to zoom. So I, can, I want to zoom into my flower and actually see it close up, and I can't do that. Mm. I agree. I agree. So it's only the magnifying glasses that we can actually click it in further. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. But yeah, you, have, you, yeah. You can zoom a little using the um, the mouse kind of scroll thing, or the plus arrow at the very top of the screen. But you're right, to get the better photos, it has to be with a magnifying glass. But I'm not, how, how do you move the magnifying glass? I'm trying to move it over to the cone flowers and I oh, can't. Yep, it's just that one spot. Wherever you find a magnifying glass, you can't yeah. move the magnifying glasses. Um, but there's a bunch of magnifying glasses all around um, each one of the photo points. Oh, so you can only see one flower. I'm only seeing one flower on this main page that it's over. Yep. Cryopsis. Yep. So you got to move to the next um, spot or you open the map to, to find another photo point. Oh, oh. But, but each one of those photo points has at least one to three magnifying glasses. Oh, well, that's, that's a little tricky. The map is really small. Yeah. This map. Well, that's a limitation. Mark, how long did this take to create? Oh, we've been working on this. Um, I mean, the photos you see were taken in um, July. OK. And so it's been kind of on and off um since then and is there a group that's making this or are you guys putting this together it's us it's um so diane de luca who um, hey everybody. diana and becky and we are back for new hampshire audubon uh, we are at the mclean center in concord and we are going to show you our demonstration evelyn i just muted you for a second because that was coming through our um our chat um, that I forgot to mention that that was a video tour that um, Becky and Diana did back in May that we wanted to add to the tour because you could um, have that, those two different bloom points in May and then versus in um, July and you can see that. Um, but this tour was developed by Diane DeLuca um, with most of the content and then Adam um, Blankenbricker, who is the technology mastermind behind this um, really complicated project. So it would be hard to recreate is what I'm getting at for someone, you know, a smaller program necessarily to recreate this for their own space. I mean, we were inspired by a virtual, a pollinator virtual tour that was in like New York. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a time investment and a technology investment. The camera that was used alone is a thousand dollars. Yeah. So we were, we were lucky enough to, um, gain a few different grants to support the purchase of that and, um, staff time. We'd be hard pressed to, um, to be able to do it without grant funding. Yeah. Did you find anything else, Marilyn, that you wanted to, to bring up? Um, no, I was I was on the tour and then it froze. Um, and so I had to refresh it. And when it refreshed, that's when it started with the vocal. Um, oh, so, okay. So that I just shut that out uh, and pulled back into the into the meeting. And it looked like 
message just came up from Audrey that we had about two more minutes. Yeah, yeah. That's a bit less. Yeah. So those, um, the charts that we were looking at, how will they be available to school groups who are looking at the tour? Will they be then built into one of the tabs in the tour or something else? And like and the, um, the activity sheet that Willow was, was demonstrating, how do teachers actually get that kind of stuff? Yeah, can I ask, answer that question um, in the main spot? Because that's a great question. Absolutely. All right, let's leave the breakout rooms and I will see you in the main session. Okay. Here I am. Thank you so much, Audrey. This is great. No problem. Our folks in room two are still chatting apparently. They're they're taking their full 15 seconds. <laughs> They'll be yanked out soon enough. Yeah, they've got 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Welcome back. I hope you all had really awesome conversations. Um, I just wanted to start with a question that Marilyn had um, in our group that I think would be beneficial for everyone to hear. Um, her question was like, how are um, teachers and students going to be able to um, access the resources that were presented in this, this webinar, which would be the activity sheet that um, Willa presented and um, some of the pollinator syndrome guides. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of to be determined. I think we're thinking that it should be embedded in a link somewhere within the tour. Um, maybe we need to make a, another tab at the bottom that's specifically for student and teacher resources. So it's like a one-stop shop. You open that and um, all of those, those guides are there. Um, but we're, like we said at the very beginning, we're open to feedback in what um, would be most useful for, for you in your classroom. Willa and Ted, did you want to share out anything that um, was talked about in your breakout room? For sure. So we, we were a little biased in that we had Diane DeLuca with us, <laughs> but we also had Sue, and Sue comes to us as a, an apiary keeper, an apiist, I believe is that term. I should know that, but I don't. Um, and also has a background in homeschooling. So we had an educator and a pollinator supporter who is seed crazy, am I right, Sue? And getting ready to do some pollination gardens of herself. So she had some great suggestions for things to add into it futuristically. Um, and that would be just a bit more information on the plants, which I think we might mm. have on the back burner. So we'd be talking about not just the common names, but also um, the scientific, the Latin binomial name. And I was thinking maybe we could talk to, again, Mark, we had We've been working at the New Hampshire Audubon with getting some of the, the native names of these plants from our Abenaki natives and seeing mm -hmm. if we can just add a little bit more information to this plant. In addition to that, maybe giving some additional growth requirement information for those species. So if people want to learn about how to propagate echinacea, they can learn some of the growth requirements that go into it, what they like, what they don't like, and ways to make it successful in their own gardens. Um. Will and Mark, if you don't mind me jumping in. So, Sue, you were just finishing up your question and then we got taken out of our breakout group. So I was going to share that one of the things that we're working on now is putting resources on New Hampshire Audubon's website and that then we would link the garden tour to the website. So for instance, one of the resources that we're working on right now is what's in bloom. And that goes through every single plant in the garden it talks about the plant. It gives you the sun. Does it want sun? Does it want shade? It talks about how, what it's attractive to, um, what pollinators might be attracted to that plant. So that, because it, it, it gets crowded, if we try to put everything in the tour itself, that means every time you click, you know, something's going to pop up at you. So the thought is that we're going to link it to our website. And that way, if you're interested in more, you can just pop into the website and see that. So that's one of the thoughts behind putting more information into the tour without getting it too cluttered when you're actually looking at it. Because every time you put in one of those magnifiers, it's just one more thing that you're seeing in the garden um, over the plants. So some of you may have other thoughts about that, but that was kind of our thought. I'm, I've been working with the person 
who does all the technical part of putting together the tour. And that was one of our thoughts. So they didn't get too cluttered when you were looking at it, but we still had a lot of information that you could go to from the tour. So I'd love to hear thoughts from those of you who look through it for the first time today. Diane, one of the thoughts that I had in our breakout session was the idea of um, more layers of information. So the one uh, box that either Willa, I think it must have been Willa or Mark opened um, that had a description in the box. And then there was the highlighted word here where you click on that and it takes you someplace else. Um, and that would serve two purposes. It would give you this opportunity to then expand on the information about a particular plant. Um, it would also give the opportunity to present content without conclusions so that your, your middle school students could go and do like this research before they got to the end point. So rather than the mountain laurel, which I looked at that says it's pollinated by native bees, there would be information about the plant and then the next step would be to find out what's pollinating it. So I, I don't know how you tease that apart, but that there's just one thought. Mm. Oh, that's, a, that's a good comment. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mark, we did have one request. Uh, Sue was hoping we can put the address to the McLean Center up. In the oh yeah, sure. So. We, we did not, we should have made a map of that in our webinar presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I can drop that in the chat for you, Sue. Um, and then I just wanted to share um, my screen once again. And I think we've got through a lot of these questions, um, but we have another few minutes. If you could think about, you know, how you might envision using this virtual tour. Um, we're, we're really interested in, in learning. Um, but first, let's, let's tackle these first two questions in a kind of an interactive way. Um, how, how, how much fun did you have on a thumb scale exploring this tour if you have your video on? Because I have two thumbs up um, because I'm really, really far into it. And I keep learning new stuff like Willa mentioned. Mm -hmm. All right, nice, thanks. Um, and another thumb scale, the students that you work with, um, do you think they would get it very easily? Like, do you think it's intuitive um, to click around or not so intuitive? Like you're gonna have to explain it for a half an hour for them to get it. I mean. The kids that I work with, they're, they're way ahead of me. Um, cool. Well, if there aren't any other um, feedback um, from the- I, was, I have something I was gonna mention. Um, I sub in schools, but I sub only in elementary schools. I think this might be a bit, um, a bit overwhelming for them, too many things to click on, but I love the page where, you know, you have to draw yourself as a pollinator. I, I don't remember which page that was, but you showed it early on. There were some, um, some worksheets for students. Um, my question is, um, will those, might those be downloadable to the teachers where they can print those out? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, like Diane was saying, um, where they ultimately live, whether that they're like within the virtual tour or on the Audubon website, it'll be very clear um, how teachers can um, download and utilize those resources. Okay, that's good. I think I'm going to bring my grandchildren to this tour this weekend, the online one, and see what they can do at the age of five and three. <laughs> that that would be awesome to hear what um, what their reactions are, Sue. So please feel free to um, reach out to us um, with, uh, with via email. They're up on the, um, the screen here. Okay. So in our last few minutes, I just wanted to thank you all so much for spending this hour with us. Um, it's been really helpful um, to me and to Diane and Willa and, and Ted and the rest of the, the team that are 
putting this tour together. Um, your feedback was really um, excellent. And um, if you have any other um, thoughts, comments, or questions, do please feel free to reach out to us. Um, that link um, will still work after this tour. Um, so if you want to continue diving into the tour today, tomorrow, this week, whenever, um, just save or bookmark that link. Um, now, when it does go live, it'll be a completely different link. But um, up until that point, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks, that link will be live um, for those of you that joined us um, today. And I just wanted to plug one more time um, the rest of the Screen to Green webinar series um, through April. And the next one um, will be on March 4th. It's a virtual program, program sampler. Um, so all of these organizations will come on and, and do a, a little pitch for what they can do online virtually as we navigate um, this strange time that we're living in. I think that's it. Everyone. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks.